Hi, I'm Dr. Vincent Ho. I'm a gastroenterologist and a senior university lecturer. I'm also the gut doctor. This is a story of inflammatory bowel disease. I must caution that this is not the full picture because our scientific knowledge of inflammatory bowel disease is increasing all the time. But knowing more about the science does provide some helpful insights into this condition. Ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are the two main forms of inflammatory bowel disease, which is commonly abbreviated as IBD. In order to better understand how IBD comes about, we first need to understand the important protective mechanisms of the gut. The gut is the largest immune organ in the body and 70% of the body's immune cells are found in the gut. Ordinarily, there are some defensive barriers in the gut that prevents microbes and other pathogens getting inside our body. This includes the mucus lining of the gut, which can trap microbes, the cells lining the outside of the gut known as the epithelial cells, which are linked together by tight junctions, and our gut's innate immune system. Giant kraken-like cells called dendritic cells are able to sample pathogens in the mucus layer via tentacle-like protrusions. And along with the gut's innate defenders, such as macrophages, defensins, innate lymphoid cells, and IgA antibodies can help prevent pathogens from breaching the epithelial layer. However, sometimes those pathogens can get through the tight junctions and into the area under the epithelium where they can potentially spread into the body. The gut adapts to this situation by triggering off a cascade of immune responses that involve B cells and T cells. The B cells can change into active plasma cells which produce antibodies. The antibodies can bind onto the pathogens and activate T cells to kill off these microbes. So the gut's immune defenses keeps these pathogens in check and stops them from going into the body and causing systemic damage. What is important to recognize is that there has to be tolerance to the gut's own commensal or native microbes. And this can be achieved through mechanisms such as activation of regulatory T cells. Because otherwise, the gut's immune system will kill off the commensal microbes. While the precise cause of IBD is unknown, it appears that genetically susceptible individuals have an abnormal mucosal immune response to commensal gut flora, which results in bowel inflammation. Once that inflammation starts, it doesn't just go away, it persists. We find that in IBD, the gut mucosa is heavily infiltrated by T cells that produce inflammatory signals called cytokines and also plasma cells that can produce immunoglobulin, particularly IgG. When it comes to cytokines, there is a shift away from a normal balance between anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory cytokines in the gut to a very pro-inflammatory state. In IBD, we have more of the pro-inflammatory cytokines active, such as TNF-alpha, interleukin-17, and interleukin-23, whilst there's less of the anti-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-10. We also find that the innate defenders of the gut also get in on the action. Innate lymphoid cells, for example, are known to be involved in inflammatory damage to the gut. Now, there are going to be slight differences between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease in terms of the immune mechanisms. For example, although we have a lot of IgG-producing plasma cells in the inflamed gut tissue for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, we tend to get a lot more IgG1 cells in ulcerative colitis and more IgG2 cells in Crohn's disease. These slight differences in the immune response together with genetic and environmental factors accounts for why ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease presents differently. In ulcerative colitis, the inflammation is restricted to the clonic mucosa, whilst in Crohn's disease, it can often involve the entire gut wall. Ulcerative colitis always involves the rectum, but can spread to involve the entire colon. This is called pancolitis. Whilst Crohn's disease can occur at any site along the gastrointestinal tract, with the areas of normal tissue between diseased tissue, we call these skip lesions. A hallmark feature of Crohn's disease, which is not always present, is a huge giant cluster of macrophages found in the gut wall called granulomas. The reason we know that genetics is important is because having a family history of IBD is a known risk factor. 
For example, the risk of a child developing IBD if both parents have IBD is quite high, slightly higher than one in three. The other significant part that influences the risk of developing IBD and also shapes the disease course is the environment. We know that previous gastroenteritis infections such as Campylobacter or Salmonella have been linked to the onset of IBD. Cigarette smoking appears to be important, and whilst it's known to worsen the course of Crohn's disease, it seems to be protective for ulcerative colitis. Both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are known to have disease flares and periods of remission. However, they often present clinically in very different ways. Due to the inflammation in the rectum, it's not surprising that ulcerative colitis can present with rectal bleeding, diarrhea, and fecal urgency. They can also present with abdominal pain and fevers in severe cases. On the other hand, Crohn's disease typically presents with non-specific symptoms such as bloating, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, or flatulence. People suffering from Crohn's disease can be malnourished if there is a lot of small bowel involvement affecting the absorption of nutrients. Since Crohn's disease can involve the entire gut wall, this can cause small leaks, and this can hollow out into a chamber known as an abscess. As the abscess develops, it can fill up with pus. In Crohn's disease, a fistula can form, which is a narrow tunnel connecting an organ to another part of the body. The fistula can even connect from the gut to the outside skin. If Crohn's disease is confined to the colon, it is often indistinguishable from ulcerative colitis, and sometimes we use a label indeterminate colitis. Fortunately, the treatment for both conditions is largely similar. The goal is to control inflammation, and by doing so, manage symptoms and reduce the likelihood of complications. IBD treatment usually involves either drug therapy or surgery. Anti-inflammatory drugs are often the first step in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. Corticosteroids are medications that can help dampen down inflammation in the bowel, and they work very quickly. They can, however, lead to a lot of complications in the longer term, which is why they're not used for maintenance therapy. An anti-inflammatory drug such as mesalazine works topically at the site of the inflamed gut and can be drug used for long-term maintenance therapy. Mesalazine is more effective in treating ulcerative colitis than Crohn's disease. If there is repeated flares or if the disease activity is not controlled by maintenance therapy, with anti-inflammatories, then the next line of drug treatment are drugs which help to dampen down the immune response. Such drugs include azathioprine, 6 mercaptopurine and methotrexate. If IBD is still not controlled by these drugs, then biological drugs are recommended. These drugs target the proteins in the body that are causing inflammation. For example, TNF-alpha is an inflammatory cytokine that's produced during inflammation and contributes significantly to inflammatory damage of the gut in IBD by activating T cells. The biological drug infliximab is an antibody that can mop up TNF alpha to prevent them from binding onto their receptors on T cells. Antibiotics can sometimes be useful to treat for complications of IBD, for example, a perianal abscess in Crohn's disease. Surgery is sometimes needed for severe disease. In ulcerative colitis, surgery that involves removal of the entire colon and rectum and the production of an internal pouch attached to the anus can be curative. In some cases, however, a pouch is not possible and a permanent opening in the abdomen is created called a stoma, where stool passes for collection into an attached bag. With Crohn's disease, surgery is not curative. However, surgery may be required to remove damaged sections of bowel, drain abscesses, and relieve intestinal obstruction. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Let me know if you've got any questions or comments down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.